there are other parametric distributions in chapter four as well that are super important. Here are their names. Gamma, exponential, chi-square, and normal. The gamma distribution is the most complicated. What's its PDF? Oh, it's beautiful. There it is. Of course. Oh, you should write that down just for the beauty of it. F of X equals one divided by what? What's that? What's that, a hangman? That's a capital gamma. That's a Greek letter, capital gamma. That's why this is called a gamma distribution. But why is there a capital gamma there? And what is it? Uh, hang on. Capital gamma of alpha. Capital gamma is a function. It's called the gamma function. Times beta to the alpha times x to the alpha minus one times e to the negative x over beta. Where x is positive, alpha is positive, and beta is positive. In reality, it should be a piecewise function, but the author is not bothering to do that. It's really zero otherwise. It's zero when x is less than or equal to zero. Where in the what, what in the world's going on here? The basic idea is that this part of the PDF is something that seems reasonable as a model for positive values of x. You've got a power of x times an exponential decay. You should remember from calc one or maybe even pre-calc that exponential decays go to zero a lot faster, so to speak, than power functions grow. Products like this of a power function growing and an exponential decay go to zero in the end pretty rapidly because of the exponential decay. Exponential decay functions dominate power functions in terms of how fast they go to zero compared to how fast power functions grow so that this product still goes to zero as X goes to infinity. Maybe it came up in a L'Hopital's rule in calculus as well. Calculate the limit of something like that as X goes to infinity. You'd want to write it as a fraction. You'd want to put the e to the negative x over beta into the bottom of the fraction as an e to the positive x over beta and differentiate with L'Hopital's rule to show it goes to zero. Maybe you did something like that in special cases like this. This definitely goes to zero as x goes to infinity. The graph for most values of alpha and beta goes like this. Up, then down. It goes. It has the x-axis as a horizontal asymptote as x goes to infinity. And exponential decay functions go to zero so fast that probably the integral of this from zero to infinity converges. Maybe you have that kind of problem in Calc 2. You know, does the integral from zero to infinity of x squared times e to the negative x converge? You should have been able to calculate that with integration by parts and compute the limit and you'd see the limit exists. I'm not taking the time to do the calculation because we got lots of things to do here. So probably the integral of that from zero to infinity converges. What does it converge to? Uh, since you got a one over there, this thing there, and you want this thing to integrate to one, I guess the integral of that part converges to gamma of alpha times beta of the alpha. What is gamma of alpha? It's the gamma function plugged in alpha. What is the gamma function? It's on the previous page. Woo. Gamma of alpha itself is an integral. What? Huh? What, what's going on here? Gamma of alpha is this integral. But wait a minute. How do you know that? How do you do that integral if you don't know alpha? Can the integral be done without knowing alpha? Or is that a kind of a nonsense question? The integral can be done for certain values of alpha and can be maybe approximated for other values of alpha. And here are some properties of the gamma function. If you plug in alpha equals one, in other words, if you if z to the alpha minus one becomes z to the zero power when alpha is one, so you're integrating e to the negative z, really. 
this property says you're going to get one. Well, maybe we should, we should do that calculation real quick. Let's do that calculation. Improper integral from zero to infinity, not one to infinity. E to the negative z dz. Okay, should I be an engineer and be lazy with not putting a limit sign? Oh, this is bad, but I'm going to do it anyway. Should I even plug in an infinity? Oh, this is really bad. That's that, okay. That's that. We should pretend you never saw it. Oh, hey, it's on YouTube. I'm being an engineer here. I'm being sloppy with my limit signs. I'm not putting limit signs in there. I'm writing e to the negative infinity, which is nonsense, and saying it equals zero. It's really a limit. This is really a limit. If you were going to define e to the negative infinity, it would make sense to define it to be zero. Though in our class, we technically don't define e to the negative infinity. It's really a limit. Sloppy, just for fun. Anyway, you get one. Oh, that confirms that first property. Capital gamma of one is one. If alpha is bigger than one, capital gamma of alpha is alpha minus one times gamma of alpha minus one. Hmm. Capital gamma of alpha is alpha minus one times ga capital gamma of alpha minus one. I wonder what that means about capital gamma of two. If alpha is two, it means, according to that property, not F, gamma. Ah, let me rewrite it. Two minus one times capital gamma of two minus one. One times capital gamma of one. One times one is one. When alpha is two, you get one. How about when alpha is three? Keep wanting to write an F. According to the property that I just showed you, that should be this. Two times capital gamma of two. Two times one is two. What's capital gamma of four? Four minus one times capital gamma of four minus one. Three times capital gamma of three. Three times two is six. Hmm, are we seeing a pattern here? Capital gamma of five. Five minus one times capital gamma of five minus one is four times capital gamma of four is four times six is 24. For an arbitrary value of n, that is a whole number, a positive integer, it looks like, well, that's four factorial there, this is three factorial. It looks like capital gamma of n would be n minus one factorial if n uh, greater than or equal to one is an integer. And that is true. But capital gamma can be evaluated at other values of n as well. Like, I wonder what capital gamma of one half is. According to the formula in the book, it's the integral from zero to infinity of z to the one half minus one e to the negative z dz, which you could write as the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative z over square root of z, which technically speaking is really a doubly improper integral. There's an infinity up there and there's a zero down there where this function might have a vertical asymptote possibly. Does this integral converge? I'm not going to try to do it by hand. Mathematica, what is capital gamma of one half? Square root of pi. Really? Uh, integral from zero to infinity, z to the negative one half times e to the negative z dz. Square root of pi. Square root of pi? What? Pi? Where are the circles? <laughs> the gamma function is wild and crazy. By that property, capital gamma of three halves should also be square root of pi. Square root of pi over two. 
Oh yeah, I was, was thinking about it again. Three halves is one more than one half. Capital gamma of three halves should be three halves minus one, one half times capital gamma, one half. Yes, square root of pi over two. This works. Alpha doesn't have to be an integer here for this to work. But when alpha is an integer bigger than one, then this is related to factorials. I guess I should have said alpha is strictly bigger than one. I, I it does work when uh, when when alpha when n is one because you get zero factorial, which is also one. So I guess it's okay to leave it like that. So this gamma function is like no other function you've ever seen before. It's defined by this integral where alpha is the variable. Can you differentiate this with respect to alpha? Yeah, but it's not clear how. Differentiate an integral where the alpha is inside the integral. That's not clear how. It's also not clear how it's related to the gamma distribution. Like, why do I need it there? That's going to come up in a homework problem. It's related to doing integrals of this thing. And why do I need a beta to the alpha there? That's going to come up in that homework problem. Really? Let's look, look ahead a little bit. Show that's true. That's going to be a homework problem. Really? Oh, oh, there's a hint. Change the variable by setting z equal to x over beta, but will that really help? It will if you use the definition of the gamma function. If you don't know about the definition of the gamma function, doing this integral by doing this substitution doesn't seem to help much. But if you relate it to the gamma function and its properties, it will definitely help. I'm not asking you to prove the properties of the gamma function. I'm not asking you to prove uh, that property in general. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to use it. You'll need to use it. And you'll need to use the formula for the gamma function. The, doing the change of variables will help you relate the integral you need to do to this formula. Why would we want to deal with such a complicated distribution? Because it could be useful. It's very flexible. There's two parameters, alpha and beta, that are arbitrary positive numbers. This works no matter what fixed positive numbers alpha and beta are. Unlike my example, where C and P could not be arbitrary, they were related to each other. C was P minus 1. Or was it 1 minus P? I forgot. I guess it was P minus 1. Alpha and beta are independent parameters. As long as they're both positive, this is going to work. Theorem. What do you want to know about the gamma uh, distribution or in general, an arbitrary gamma random variable that's got a gamma distribution? How about its moment generating function? How about its mean? How about its variance? There they are. Should you be able to derive these? Well, you should certainly be able to do a two and three when you know one, right? Two could be found by using one, taking the derivative with respect to t, plugging in zero, just like in the exam, just like always with moment generating functions. How do you prove one? It's the expected value of e to the tx. So you'd have to integrate this thing times e to the tx. Doesn't sound so easy, but evidently is doable. And evidently you get this. I'm not remembering exactly offhand how difficult it is. Probably some sort of similar substitution and knowledge about the gamma function is necessary again, I'm guessing. Do you need to memorize these things? No, because they'll be in the table that you provide. I provide for exam two. What do statisticians do with these things? If they think the gamma distribution is a good model, well, first of all, they have to test to see if it's a good model. They got some data. Is there some value of alpha and beta that makes the gamma dis distribution, this PDF, a good fit for the data? Making a dot plot. There's some choice of alpha and beta that makes this a good fit, giving you good estimates for probabilities. There are statistical tests you can do to try to test such a thing. 
And if it is a good model, you can do more statistics to try to estimate alpha and beta. We'll talk about that in chapter seven. What do we do with this now besides the homework problem I mentioned? It's best for our purposes mostly to simplify this to certain special cases. The first special case is to take alpha to be one. If alpha is one, x to the alpha minus one is x to the zero is one. The x term goes away. If alpha is one there, beta to the alpha is just a beta. And hey, gamma of one is one. This simplifies a lot if alpha is one. It simplifies, in fact, to that density when alpha is one. It's called an exponential distribution. And yeah, that's an exponential decay function. The graph looks like this. And the integral of that, no matter what positive value beta takes on, is going to equal one. Integral from zero to infinity. What's the mean going to be? Use that formula with alpha equal to one. The mean is beta. What's the variance? Use this formula when alpha is one. The variance is beta squared. I guess the standard deviation would be beta. This PDF has a graph that looks like this. Probability is found by integrating. Its mean is beta. Its variance is beta squared. Its standard deviation is beta. Very nice and simple. A nice, simple distribution. What kind of applications does it have? One kind of application it has is wait times for Poisson processes over time. It's a Poisson process. Well, like on the exam, the earthquake problem, right? Count the number of earthquakes, say, during a two-year in, two inter, year interval when you know the average number of earthquakes per two years is two. Large earthquakes, not the small ones. The 500 small earthquakes, that was just extraneous information in that problem. They didn't need it. Two large earthquakes over two year periods, on average, we used a Poisson distribution to count the number of earthquakes per two year period, probabilities for, the, for that. That's a count, that's discrete. What about a variable that measures how long you have to wait until the next big earthquake? Half a year, one year, one and a half years? That wait time, if the count follows a Poisson distribution, the wait time till the next earthquake follows an exponential distribution, and that's what this theorem says. Consider a Poisson process with parameter lambda, with where you can take the lambda to be k, really, if you're imagining uh, to represent the mean over whatever time period you happen to be thinking about. Let w denote the time of occurrence of the first event, which turns out to be equivalent to the time of occurrence of the next event. So that has to be proved. If you've already had a couple of earthquakes, can this still model the time until the next earthquake? It turns out it can. Then W has an exponential distribution with beta equal to one over lambda. So if lambda is two, if you average two earthquakes, uh, per, okay, it's weird to phrase it as a two year period. Let's pretend it's a different, slightly different problem. Let's pretend you average two earthquakes per one year period. So K is still two, but now I'm thinking about one year periods instead of two year periods. Then the wait time till the next earthquake, or to the first earthquake, if you prefer, is going to be exponential with beta, the mean, equal to one over two, one half. If on average you have two earthquakes per year, then on average you're going to have to wait half a year for the first earthquake or the next earthquake. Makes good intuitive sense. What's the proof of this theorem? Can you, can, and can you understand it? Yes, you can understand this. Let's go through it. Proof. The distribution function, capital F for W, is what? What's the distribution function? Hmm, it's a capital F. It's a CDF. 
which in general, for continuous random variables, is an integral like this from minus infinity to infinity, from minus infinity to x of the PDF. But wait a minute, I don't see any integrals here. It's because you don't need an integral. Yes, this is true. This equation defining the CDF is true for continuous random variables, but it's not necessary to use here. This first equality there is an equality that's always true for CDFs, whether your variable is discrete or continuous. It's always the probability that your random variable is less than or equal to the given number, which by the complement rule is always equal to that. Here's the hard part, is this paragraph. The first occurrence of the event, like the first earthquake from now, will take place after time little w. What is little w? It's arbitrary. You could pretend it's, I don't know, two thirds of a year, two thirds. Only if no occurrences of the event are occur in the first two thirds of a year. If you let x denote the number of occurrences of the event in the time interval, say a year, x is a Poisson variable, random variable, with parameter lambda times w over this interval. If lambda is two earthquakes per year, and w is two thirds of a year, lambda times w would be two times two thirds is four thirds, 1.3 repeating average number of earthquakes over two thirds of a year, eight months. Thus, the probability that capital W is bigger than little w, pretend that's two thirds, is the same as the probability that x equals zero. No earthquakes have occurred during that first two thirds of a year. Use the formula for the Poisson distribution that equals that. That's the Poisson, PMF, chapter three. Plugging that in up here, this that means capital F W is one minus that thing. Um, what do I do now? Differentiate it. The derivative of the CDF is the PDF. I haven't mentioned that yet, but it's true. If capital F of X equals this integral, calc two or even calc one, Fundamental theorem of calculus implies that capital F prime of X is little f of X. The variables in the upper limit of the integral and differentiating an integral, that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Wait a minute, is it? Isn't the fundamental theorem of calculus telling you how to do an integral like f of B minus f of A? That's the fundamental theorem of calculus in chapter five of your calc book. But the one in chapter six is this. If the variable is in the upper limit of the integral, then to differentiate this function, effectively, you just get rid of the integral sign in the dt and replace that t with an x. You do want these variable names to match. A common mistake here is to make that an f of t. That doesn't make any sense, though. These need to match. t is just a dummy variable for the integral. It doesn't matter what you call it. Just don't call it x, because that's the upper limit of the integral, a variable upper limit of integration. Differentiating such a function gives you the function right there. Chapter six of your calc book, look it up. Section 6.4. They don't do it with the minus infinity there, but it does work with the minus infinity. That's what's being used here. The derivative of the CDF is the PDF. And yeah, that's the same formula as this. If beta is one over lambda, lambda is one over beta. If beta is one over lambda, then lambda is one over beta. It's a symmetric kind of equation. You verified that this is the right PDF. And W can only take on positive values here. It's a wait time, can't be negative. It is assumed here the PDF is zero when W is negative.
Another special case, I guess we're not gonna to get to the normal distribution today, that's, that's okay. Another special case is called the chi-square distribution, or well, some people say chi-square, that's what our book is saying. Some people just say chi-square. Which one's right? Well, they're both used. Um, I think it's in general it's better to say chi-square, though sometimes I say squared because you're not literally literally squaring anything, that's why. Let X be a gamma random variable with beta equal to two and alpha equal to, what's that funny thing? That's a little gamma. Little gamma over two, where little gamma is a positive integer. Capital gamma and little gamma look nothing alike. Let X be a capital gamma random variable with beta equal to two and alpha equal to little gamma over two for little gamma, a positive integer. One, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. So alpha could be one half, one, three halves, two, four halves, two, I already said four halves, which is two, five halves, three, seven halves, four. Alpha could take on half integer values. But the thing you focus on is the gamma. Gamma's call, got a name, it's called the degrees of freedom. We denote this random variable by, what's that? X squared sub gamma? No, don't say X, say chi. That's not an X, even though it looks like an X. It's a chi, Greek letter, capital chi. C-H-I if you want to spell it in English. But don't say chi, say chi. Uh, chi squared sub gamma. Um, why is it called chi squared? Because the person who thought of it felt like calling it that. Is it really squared? No, not really. So why write a square? That's a mystery at the moment. It's related to some things later on that do involve squaring, but not now. It's gamma, but a special case. Beta is two, alpha is gamma over two. So it's PDF would be the same as this PDF, except you'd have to replace this beta and that beta with a two. And you'd have to replace this alpha and that alpha with little gamma over two. And if little gamma, for example, was one, then little gamma over two would be one half. You'd be calculating capital gamma of a half, which we know is square root of pi. Pi becomes involved, it's weird. Exponential distribution because of the Poisson process thing is pretty simple, relatively easy to understand. You could see some applications for it. What are some applications of chi-square distribution? They come up in statistics a lot. This is a very special distribution in many applications in statistics. I don't have the time to go into them at the moment. You want to look further in the book? I think chapter 16, way in chapter 16, I think it is, is one big application. We don't get to chapter 16, by the way, by the end of the course. That comes up maybe in applied stats next semester. What can you do with this chi-square distribution right now? Well, not much without technology. The last eight minutes will be technology focused. Calculator. Distribution menu. Saving the normal for Thursday. Is there a gamma or exponential or chi-squared in here any somewhere? Well, unfortunately, only chi-square. And the calculator makes the chi look a little fancier, like a curvy X there. But that's a chi as well. Chi-square PDF, chi-square CDF. So if you wanted to use the, the calculator to find for a chi-square random variable, say with three degrees of freedom, what is the probability of being less than or equal to two, for example? X starts out at zero. Remember with a gamma, X is positive. If I want the probability of X being less than two, 
with three degrees of freedom, that's the little gamma. DF is degrees of freedom, that's the little gamma. 0.4276. If you want the probability of X being greater than two, do one minus that, 0.5724. Can it be done with Mathematica as well? Mm -hmm. CDF, I square distribution of Mathematica doesn't say squared, but says square, although it mixes in with the word distribution. So it looks like chi-squared distribution, but chi-squared distribution. If you're unsure of the syntax, go to the help center and click on that information button. You can also get there through the help menu documentation center brings you here. You want to look up chi-squared distribution, it brings you here. The thing inside the PDF or CDF is the distribution name, in this case, chi-squared distribution. Mathematica says in square brackets, that's where you put the degrees of freedom. Huh. That looks like a V, but it's actually another Greek letter. It's called a nu, not a B. Oh, box elder bug. Okay. That's a Greek letter new, but, uh, or maybe it's meant to be a gamma, but it doesn't look like a gamma. <clears throat> That's the degrees of freedom. So we got three degrees of freedom here. Then put a comma and then put two in our case for the probability that X is less than or equal to two. If I answer this, it's probably not going to give me a numerical approximation, though. It's what? is that. It's just using some special function called gamma regularized, and we don't need to know what that is. But what is that approximately? 0.4276, same thing we got in the calculator. The percent sign here is referring to the preceding output slash slash capital N does a numerical approximation. I also could have done slash slash capital N at the end here. I also could have done this. I also could have just put a decimal point in here to get numerical approximations. I, I would feel bad if I also didn't show you the table in, in the book, even though you really don't need to use it. But it is worth still talking about it for historical curiosity in part, but also for some notation that the textbook uses some special notation that is discussed in this example and above. This equation right here is very confusing looking, but you wanna get used to this. If you wanna understand the reading, you need to understand this kind of, this equation right here. The probability that a chi-squared random variable with gamma degrees of freedom, that's a little gamma right there, is greater than or equal to a lowercase chi-squared sub r is equal to r. What in the world? This is a standard symbolic way to represent the following picture. Say your chi-square with gamma degrees of freedom, PDF, has a graph that looks like this. That is a pretty typical looking graph for a chi-squared PDF. I'll write that as a capital chi-square sub-gamma PDF. That's what it represents. This equation is a symbolic way of saying that lowercase chi squared sub r has a probability of the random variable being greater than or equal to it, not less than or equal to it, 
equal to R. The subscript here matches the area here. The area to the right of that number is R. Besides being just confusing in general, it also seems inconsistent. We're specifying the degrees of freedom as a subscript there, but that subscript is not a degrees of freedom, it's an area. But this is standard notation. So if, for example, you wanna find the probability that my, in my case where gamma is three again, that a chi-squared random variable with three degrees of freedom is less than or equal to two. And if I want to use a table in the back of the book, well, I can, I can say this is one minus the probability that chi-squared random variable with three degrees of freedom is greater than two. And according to this notation, that can also be written as one minus the number little chi squared sub, uh, oh, no, no, I'm writing that one. This is one minus this probability, little chi squared sub r, where you have to figure out what r is. And how do you figure out what r is with the table? Let's do that, that'll end class. So we're gonna go a little over time, but this is worth it. The table in the back, what table? Uh, cumulative chi-squared distribution, table four, goes over a couple pages. The degrees of freedom is over here. We're after three degrees of freedom. Oh, this is extra confusing. The numbers up here represent areas to the left, not to the right. We're after the number in here that's closest to two. 2.37 is closest to two. If this number here were a 2.37 instead of a two, The area to the left would be 0.5, and therefore the area to the right would also be 0.5. And the answer would be 1 minus 0.5 equals 0.5. It's not a 2.37, it's a 2. Therefore, the area to the left is between 0.25 and 0.5, meaning the area to the right is between 0.5 and 0.75 for our example going here, meaning this answer is between 0.25 and 0.5. And we got, what was it, 0.4 or something. Oh, that's confusing. Study the example well as well as you can to help you do the homework. We'll talk about this more on Thursday.